All right, welcome to the Robert Show. Look who I have with me, Anil from Starburst. Anil, welcome to the Robert Show. It's such a pleasure to host you, and this is your debut, right? Yes, indeed. Awesome. Pleasure's mine. Awesome. So, Anil, I obviously wanted to, you know, chat about uh, many th many announcements that you guys have made, but uh, in general, also what's happening. But just for our audience, would you like to introduce yourself? What do you like, uh, and what do you do at Starburst? Absolutely. Uh, I am Anil Mariboy. I'm a principal solutions architect with Starburst. Uh, been with the company about three years, but I've been in tech uh, a little over two decades, worn many hats. Uh, love all things data, uh, coffee, wine, golf, and tennis. You like any of those? You can be my friend very easy. Data, coffee, wine, and tennis and golf. So, there you go. That's awesome. Uh, Anil, uh, I'm going to jump right in. Obviously, you've been in uh, the data space for more than two decades, I guess. And uh, you've seen so many challenges, but you've also uh, seen, you know, obviously built so many solutions for, you know, a lot of enterprises out there. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the recent announcements you all have made as well, but in general, I wanted to, you know, ask you about what types of data challenges do you see complex organizations struggle with, specifically in relation to hybrid or multi-cloud environments? Because that's one of the things that I hear from a lot of enterprise leaders too, that, oh, this is a little bit of challenging for them. Absolutely. See, I, data has always been around. I don't think data has ever been a challenge. Right. I, in my view, I think the challenge has always been how you approach data. Mm. Uh, and it gets like, you know, distributed computing, we all know it, it can help things, you know, you can do a lot more things in parallel, a lot of, you know, cool things, you can decompose, you can scale, you get all the lot of benefits, but also it complicates, it increases rates of failure and such. Uh, so as you go into the cloud, as you go into its, these modern architectures, one of the challenges is that not all clouds are the same. They each have their own quirks. There are nuances. Right. And uh, things that are native to one cloud may not be native to other. And of course, you know, cloud is a new thing. And right. a lot of these large enterprises, especially those I work with, right, those are mostly who I work with, they, their origin is really on-prem. They've built things on-prem. So when they go into cloud, or as they transition between clouds, often what happens is, they're trying to uh, contrive the cloud as a data center or treat mm. it as a data center, often do the lift and shift sort of thing into the cloud. Mm. Um, and then you are now stuck with like, you know, or stuck with no value or loss of benefits you otherwise would have gotten with the cloud. Right. right? So, what I think, you know, I, I personally am enjoying evangelizing is, what if we start treating the on-prem, at least for the analytical workloads? What if we treat on-prem or build some parity of on-prem to the cloud? You have object stores available on-prem, Dell, who's our premier partner, and of course right. there are many others. Um, with the object stores, decoupling computer and storage, some of these like foundational ways to mm. move from you know how things have transpired. And just like you know, you know, almost like a refresher of how things have transpired in the past, right? Right. Anytime any enterprise wants to do something faster, something different, something bigger, they always have to undertake a migration. Right. Uh, you know, we had mainframes, then we saw like, hey, here are the rela relational databases. Mm. And then we thought, let's go and use this relational databases warehouses. So like, you know, how did you model your data, your Kimbo, Inman, you know, how, that all went right. to warehouses. But one of the things you want to notice is, you went with this like agnostic modeling, right, Kimbo, and one, how you want to structure your data tables and data models and such. But it didn't mean you could take that, you know, data from one platform to another, mm. tease it to Teradata, et cetera, you know, or, or whatever you might be Interesting. doing. Interesting, yeah. It always, you know, even though the structure is agnostic, data is yours, the data is always like, you know, it meant as you move, you had to do undertake a migration. Right. Then came Hadoop to the world, right? So we thought, okay, they're kind of like deep <laughs> computer storage, yeah. and let's do another migration. Uh, and you know, once you got there, you realize, yes, there is some degree of decoupling, but it's not fully decoupling; it's loosely coupling. You had like option of certain compute engines to go with that data mm. to use against mm. that data. Interesting. But still, yeah. if you wanted to expand, like you know, the storage or compute, you're throwing nodes, more nodes at the same Hadoop cluster. So what's interesting is Starburst is uh, born out of that problem. Our founders, the Presto, then Trino, uh, and now Starburst for Enterprises, is is really how do we decouple the compute and storage fully? Yeah. And how that's gonna you know really end this perpetual migration syndrome. 
looks like very impactful for the data leaders out there, and it's going to help them uh, to reach a certain level of approach, as he said, right? Yeah, I think the, 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 any anybody uh, referring to your customer data, your product data, as those data sets, like with your business context, right. is a meaningful thing to do. But if somebody is calling, uh, you know, your data is uh, your data is Oracle or you know Teradata or Starburst or anything, I, I don't think that should be the case. Your data should be your data. You should have the ability to bring the compute that fits your purpose mm. and use it against that data. It should be pluggable. Very interesting. Yeah. No, I think those are great insights, uh, Anil. And uh, just on this topic, instead of you know, uh, you mentioned about. Um, this, but I, I really want to, you know, just jump on this as well. Instead of treating the cloud just as another on-premise, uh, you know, migration, how can companies strategically build an architecture that will, say, last beyond more than three years? It, it's really uh, that, you know, you, you, if you if you take like you know, there, there is a. Um, the 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 migration like uh, in terms of the on-premise ma migration, how do you see how how can companies strategically you know obviously move and keep up with it like keep up with the strategically uh, build an architecture which is more than for three years at least. Oh sure 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 yeah. So see the, the problem is still that right like I said earlier by the time you finish the migration you undertook you reach the steady state but then it's very young years in. Excuse me. In yeah. production, yeah. you're looking at the next migration because you know you enable the business to True. do new things, cool things. True. Now they're coming like you know what used to be difficult has become easier, but still like you know now they're ready to do something bigger, right? Mm. So that is where they're coming to you. This constant demand for migration. Right. But the truth is that really, let's continue to decouple things that make sense, like your compute and storage, and have a well-defined right. metadata layer. That aligns with your with your business and your domain, and now every compute should be able to play seamlessly, easily with that metadata and data. Mm. So that's precisely how Starburst functions. Very interesting, and I always love these natural conversations because it brings so much uh, in detail about what you're thinking and how do you approach it. On you, you definitely have a unique analogy for data as a Rosetta Stone, right? Can you tell us more about it uh, and what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, it's, it's a pretty uh, fun little uh, metaphorical device for me, right? Uh, you got in, in, in these three different uh, scripts that Rosetta Stone itself has written. Uh, you got the hieroglyphics, you got the Greek, and you got you know uh, another uh, Egyptian language in the middle. Mm. I'm almost drawing a blank on its name, but uh, no worries. Yeah. Um, so, what you'll see is you know to me, it sort of like you know looks like data the metadata, and then also uh, uh, the your know, business ontology, or like what your our glossary, for example. Right. Like the hieroglyphics look like picture, right? A, you know, a cat, or a, you know, a man, or a person, or a cave, or any of those, you know, they're readable, sun, moon, etc. cetera, right? Uh, so they're like almost pictorial, right? So when people do business, you're doing business about your business, your products, your customers, your services, those are the things that are representative of your business. And ultimately, your data should have that sort of rendition mm. for your data consumers. That's sort of like the top layer of your Rosetta Stone, right? right? Now you got the data at the very bottom and then the metadata in the middle. I, in my opinion, to the extent possible, each and every layer of this, your data, metadata, and the abstractions that, are, that facilitate your business, should not should avoid any vendor lock. Mm. So these abstractions belong to you. They should be pluggable, usable with the next iteration of technologies or tools that you want to bring in. Right. Uh, if you have these in a steady state, I think you'll need to migrate to the next platform. To the next platform, only to migrate to another platform will come down. Maybe it may not be like you know. You know, zero migrations, right? It may not be quite that, but at least, like, you know, you wouldn't have to undertake 
such rapid iteration of these migrations and, and your data shouldn't be owned by anybody but you. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I love these insights. And also in terms of, you know, Starburst always has like openness mm -hmm. that you always, uh, you know, have the in the culture, but also you kind of prefer for the community. Do you want to share a little about that? Uh, and how does, how do you see the near future? Say in the next one year, I wouldn't even say next two years, to be honest, but where do you see it going in 2024? Well, uh, one of the fun aspects of working at Starburst is I have this unique privilege to meet customers where they are, right? Yes. If you are in a, you know, in GCP, you know, thanks to our friends at Google here today, yeah. right? Uh, or if you're in AWS, Azure, any cloud or private cloud, your own data centers, you can deploy Starburst wherever it is. If you need like finer control, you want to deploy, manage your own, use still like all cloud native principles, mm. deploy it on Kubernetes, manage your own, absolutely do it. You, you know, we've seen some extremely large uh, workloads, nice. you know, across many large customers. Um, and then, of course, you know, for those who don't want any overhead of running platforms, you know, <laughs> right. uh, which used to be a pretty fun thing to do for me, um, there's uh, you know, our, our Galaxy offering, their SaaS offering, right? right? Still, even when you go Galaxy, right, use our SaaS offering, you still are not putting your data into Starburst. You're not mm. storing your data in any Starburst or any proprietary format. Right. We, you know, we love Iceberg. You know, we wow. love like you know the file formats that Farcase and Orcs and the, all the open formats, or even Delta for that matter. But for you to build that very open, open data formats, that's your foundational layer. True. Right? True. And metadata, even that, keep it in a very open, transportable, and something that could be used in any cloud. And also, you're not, you know, you're not inheriting a vendor lock with it. Keep it in some sort of like you know open framework, right. either stores or anything that's you know of that ilk, um, and then focus on you know when, when you are not undertaking these migration burdens and these sort of things, you can deploy where your data is, and you can deploy and uh, you know in an elastic fashion to meet your workload, zig and zag as your workloads demand, not right. because you know you want to deploy some high watermark capacity. Exactly. Right. So you get to do all of those things, and I think uh, with GDC there has been an announcement of like Starburst, you know, and deployments that go into even air gap networks. So it's it's a uber privilege to me to say, yes. you know, I, you know, we can meet customers wherever they are. Nice. Uh, and of course, there are many other innovations um, and new features that, of course, last gonna steal like in our product team's thunder and I'll let them do, you know, in uh, right. They they have a bunch, and some might have come out today. Uh, most. People can see yes, that in news for and sure. blog posts that have come out. Uh, a lot of these data management things that you had to go, uh, you know, bring another set of tools to do. Uh, where some of those are like, you know, with our open architecture, we easily lend them mm. to our customers. So, like, you know, we are starting to expose those uh, where people can actually get more and more value out of the customer, wow. uh, out of their data, metadata, and what they're actually doing with doing. the data itself. Right. Oh, this is these are lovely insights. Thanks for sharing that, Anil. I know I'm pretty sure our audience would also love to reach out to you, learn more about you know all the insights, but in general as well. So, which is the best place they can learn? Uh, where can they connect with you? Uh, uh, and are there any resources that they can look at? Oh. Uh, Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, look at my name, Anil uh, Maddie Boyd. It's a mouthful last name to pronounce. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll out. share it. We'll share yeah. the tag, right? Well, thank you. I appreciate yes. it. You know, um, I had no choice. It's uh, given this one. <laughs> uh, so you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, or you can always email me at anil.maddieboyda at starburstdata.com. Um, you know, if you find me, say hi. You know, if you see me at a conference or you know any of the speaking sessions I do. Please come say hi, and I'd love to know, like you know, what you guys are doing. Um, you know, I'm, I've been pretty privileged to meet so many people, and had the privilege to work with so many amazing people. Right. I got to learn from so many other brilliant people. Right. Uh, you know, as much as I love to share my thoughts and ideas, I'd love to learn from others too. So please, uh, you know, we're an open core company. Our spirit is always open. Yes. We're, you know, we're ready for next conversation. This is great, Anil. It was such a pleasure hosting you on the Ravid Show. Thanks for all the great insights that you shared, and uh, definitely looking forward to keeping our chat, uh, continuing our chat uh, for a longer, longer time, and learn more uh, from what's coming up uh, at Starburst. Absolutely, Ravid. It's an absolute pleasure and honor. 
Aditi, thank you so much for the help. Uh, <laughs> yep, with that. Thank cheers. you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone.